Welcome to Report Writing for Clients, Part 3. My name is Carrie Meyer. I'm an accredited genealogist. For those of you who have joined me for Part 1 and Part 2, you know that we are talking about the different types of reports that you can write for a client. Uh, to recap, there are two basic types. There's the narrative report which is the uh, story or family history, and there is the research report, which is more academic and analytical. And it is the research report that we're gonna talk about in section three. So thank you for joining me today. Um, let's talk about how to go ahead and get started. So just like you did for the narrative report, you're going to make a cover page. Be sure it clearly indicates who this report is going to be about. In this case, it's about the descendants of Thomas Graham. And then also be sure that it's obvious that you are the creator and author of this report. It doesn't have to have fancy background. You don't have to have a photograph. If you have one, that's great. It makes it more visually attractive, but you're not always going to have that. So don't, don't feel that it's a necessary part. The necessary elements are making it obvious that you wrote it, and this is a, what this is about. Okay, so some of the other things that are gonna be important when we are talking about writing the research report that we're gonna cover are clearly stating your research objectives, a bullet pointed list or a few sentences will do, just make it obvious what your goals are, what you're going to do. And then you're gonna write a short paragraph including background information. Now what I mean by this is the information that was provided to you by the client when you were hired. In other words, what they already knew. It's the information that they gave you to help make sure that you have identified the correct individual. So this isn't your opportunity to, let's say, your, your subject fought in the Civil War. This isn't where you put in background information on the Civil War. This section here is just where you do a quick recap of what the client already knew. Okay, so once you've got that down and you begin researching, if your background information that was provided to you by your client isn't firmly supported by documentation, you're going to want to start by verifying that it's accurate. Now, if they have given you a stack of documents that clearly prove that you know, this person was born this time, this place, this was their, their spouse. You don't need to go back and verify that. But if, if what they've given you, let's say, is from family tradition, it's from an unsourced family group sheet, it's from family history that someone wrote up, but they didn't source any of their information, in that case, yeah, you're going to want to start by verifying because you don't there, there are instances where you'll have a client that's just sure that they are the descendant of this person and they're mistaken, or they're just sure that they have Native American blood and they don't. So you're, you're going to want to make sure and verify if what they've given you doesn't clearly confirm the story they've told you. But otherwise, just go ahead and get started on research with the re research objectives. Um, as we talked about in part one, you're going to want to create citations or footnotes as you research. So I know a lot of people like to save that to the end because that's the tedious and boring part. But if you look in part one, you'll see a example of how to make a quick chart for citations to help make that easier for you. And if you do it as you research, it saves you time in the end and it's helpful. And then um, another tip that I'd like to point out is it's nice to write as you research. Sometimes it's nice just to start getting things down on paper, especially since we get to use word processors now. You can go back and rearrange later. It just helps sometimes to just get started and get some stuff down. Okay, I'm going to give you some tips for um, effective writing. So one of the things that I think is important is sticking to your research objectives. We're also going to discuss being clear and concise in your explanations. In other words, avoid giving your client a travelogue, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Write to your audience. Be sure that you have your audience in mind. If you are writing to a client who hired you to do the research for them, chances are really high that they are not an expert in genealogy. Now, you may get a professional genealogist or someone who's really good that hires you because they don't have the time or they're not an expert in a certain region. 
But generally speaking, a client that takes the time to hire you is hiring you because they don't know how to do it themselves. So um, be sure to write to your audience. And we'll cover that a little more in a minute. Never write in the first person or in the present tense and know when analysis is necessary and when it's not. So let's get started with sticking to your research objectives. Sometimes, as we discussed in previous uh, sessions of this course, people tend to stick to kind of a formula that they're going to find everything. I'm going to find the birth, the marriage, the death. I'm going to find the parents. I'm going to find the children. I'm going to find every spouse. That's great if that's what your client hired you for. But remember, this session is about writing for clients. So as we discussed in part one, be sure that you understand your client's research objectives. So, for example, in this case, the client has hired the researcher to do the following. The main objective for this research report is to identify the parents of Anne Marie Howard. Additional objectives include finding out when and where Anne Marie Howard was born and finding out if she was married previous to her marriage to Michael O'Hare. Okay, so in this case, the client wants the parents to be identified. Shh, the client is not asking the researcher to find out who Anne Marie's children are. The client is hiring the genealogist to find out if Anne Marie was married before she married Michael O'Hare, but the client, the genealogist is not being hired to find out when and where Michael were married. So remember, it's important to stick to the research objectives. Don't go off on a tangent. So in this case, background information was provided. According to the client, they gave a copy of a Bible. They had the O'Hare family Bible and they had this information recorded. Michael O'Hare and Anne Marie were married in County Tyrone, Ireland on the 22nd of May, 1863. Anne died the 30th of May, 1902 in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They had two children, twins, Heidi and Hobart, excuse me, and they were born in Belfast, Ireland. According to family lore, Anne's first husband died in China fighting in the Opium Wars, but they had no documentation to prove that fact. Okay, so in this case, what's appropriate and what's not? When are you deviating from your research objectives and staying on target? So in this case, it is appropriate to search for records that could prove who Anne's parents were. Why? Because that's what the client asked for. It is correct to search for records that may provide Anne's birth information. Why? because that was one of the research objectives that the client asked for. Okay, yes, it is right to search for records that could prove whether or not Anne had been married before Michael, and if so, to whom she had been married to. Yes, as you, I, I know I'm stating the obvious, but yes, this is appropriate, because again, this is what the client asked for. It is not appropriate to search for records that would provide information on Michael's birth or death nor should you be attempting to identify Michael's parents. Why? Because the client didn't ask you to. They have the O'Hare family Bible. There is a good chance that they already know this information. Even if they don't, their priority is Anne Marie and the Howard line. So remember, stay on target. It is incorrect to search for further details on the lives of Anne's children, Heidi and Hobart. Why? Well, they already know the birth information. The fact that they're hiring you says that it is likely that the client is a descendant of one of these two. And again, the client did not hire you to find this out. So remember, stick to your research objectives. Don't go on a tangent. Okay. Now remember when I said avoid giving a travel log. This is what I mean. I'm going to read you my example. This is a travel log example. Since Anne Marie Howard and Michael O'Hare were married in Ireland, that is where the research began. Find My Pass is an excellent database that has a collection of records from the United Kingdom. Since Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, it was thought that records might be found in this database. 
However, there were so many Anne Marie Howards born in Ireland that there was no way of knowing for sure which one was her. So the research turned to Pennsylvania, where Anne was known to have died. First census records were checked, etc., etc. Okay, that is an example of a travel log. It's unnecessary to use phrases such as, that is where the search began, or the research then turned to. Now, I'm not telling you this is wrong, but it's less effective and it's not really professional sounding writing. Okay, it is not necessary to tell your reader what archive or library or database you use. Simply include that information that you found and then cite the database or the library or wherever you got the information from, but you don't need to say, I found it in Find My Pass or I found it at the Dallas Public Library. That's not necessary. Okay, it's usually a lot more effective writing and more pleasant and enjoyable to read when it's concise and to the point. So let me give you another example. Sorry. Okay. United States census records after 1850 usually include an approximate birth year and a birth state or country for the individuals being enumerated. Anne and Michael O'Hare were identified on the 1900 census record living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The document estimated Anne's birth year as 1837 and said that she was born in England and Anne and Michael were not located on any census records before that time. However, a death record for the son of Hobart O'Hare said that his mother, Anne Marie Howard, was born in Walton on the Hill, England. Okay, this is usually a more effective way of doing it for a few reasons. For example, it's usually a lot more efficient when you're researching to work your way back in time. Now you will have situations where you're hired to find the descendants, but generally speaking, it's easier to research when you search your way back in time. Um, in the travel log, log example, the researcher started in Ireland in a failed attempt to find Anne's birth record. In the other example, the researcher started in Pennsylvania where Anne died and learned that she had actually been born in England even though she had been married in Ireland. So this researcher knew that it would be a waste of time to research in Ireland, they, they knew to start in England. Okay, so make sure that you are being efficient. Also, it's helpful in this case, as I said before, if someone's hiring you, chances are high that they're not extremely familiar with uh, genealogy or at least how to do it. So sometimes, especially, it's a good idea to introduce a record type and what it's used for. In this case, census records usually include the following information. It just kind of gives an explanation of what you're doing and it's more effective than, I found a census record on Find My Past or I discovered a birth record on Ancestry.com. So this is helpful information, even though it is a little bit of background. Okay, also, in this case, looking at Anne's son's death record was appropriate because it led to information about Anne. So remember before I said that it was not appropriate to research Hobart and Heidi because the client didn't ask you to. In this case, the reason that we were looking at Hobart's record is because, as I said, his record helped guide you to what you needed to find for Anne. So in that case, it is appropriate, it is appropriate to look at the children's uh, information, even if that wasn't uh, one of the research objective. It's going to, if it's going to guide you to what you need for who you are supposed to be researching, that is a great strategy. Okay, write to your audience. If you're writing for a private client and not an academic journal, as I said, chances are high that your client is not familiar with genealogical termino terminology. So avoid phrases or terms that your audience might not be familiar with. Examples are negative evidence or secondary source. If you choose to use them, that's okay. Just be sure that you make an explanation the first time you introduce that phrase or word so that your reader knows what you're talking about. 
And also, again, like I mentioned before, your reader may not understand the uses of certain record types. So the first time, it's just helpful to give a quick explanation of what that particular document is used for. Now, once you've done it, you don't have to do it over and over again. So for example, you've got, let's say, a three generations report. In your first generation, you used census records. You explained to your reader what census records were for. You don't need to do it again in generations two and generations three. OK. Never write in the first person or the present tense. That's not appropriate for this type of report. So for example, Anne and Michael O'Hare are living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1900. Their son Hobart O'Hare dies in Reynoldsburg, Ohio on the 24th of June, 1957. According to his death record, his mother Anne is born in Walton on the Hill. Okay, so you kind of get the idea and then the conclusion here, I have personally researched and reviewed all these documents using primary and using primary and secondary, doc, secondary documents. I have come to the conclusion that Anne Marie Howard is the daughter of Lionel Howard and Anne, Anne Darby. Okay, so this is not appropriate. Um, these people lived in the past. So they are not living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They were living in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So even, even now, even as a living person, you do not say something like, I am born. You say, I was born. So don't write in the present tense. That's weird. And also, don't refer to yourself. There are other ways to go about it without, I have researched and reviewed. And again, it, it would also be better to avoid using your, uh, referring to yourself as well as the researcher has personally reviewed. Just primary and secondary documentation have proven that Anne Marie Howard is the daughter of Lionel Howard and Anne Darby. That would be sufficient without any reference back to yourself. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, know when to analyze a document and when not to. Sometimes analysis is absolutely necessary. You as a researcher, have to take the time to look at each document and analyze and figure it out. And a lot of times there are complicated cases. There are cases using indirect evidence where you have to, there's, there's no actual document that says specifically this person is the child of this couple. You, you have to use different documentation to pull that together and figure it out. And then you have to analyze it and then explain your analysis to your reader. But there are cases where things are really straightforward. Let's say you've got a birth certificate and there's just no need to just go into a in-depth analysis of something that's obvious. So sometimes a detailed discussion is necessary and sometimes it's not. So it's important to know when to take the time to do it and when not to. Like I said, if the information is self-explanatory, don't, don't bother with an analysis. This type of paper is already kind of, it can be pa painful to read. It can be boring and tedious. So cut out what's not necessary. If information is different document, um, in, if different documentation provide contradictory information or an analysis is necessary, then you're, you're going to have to take the time to write it up. Okay, so for example, um, you're going to want to also mm, do an analysis or an explanation when someone's got a really common first or last name. So let's say you've been hired to research or research John Parker or William Smith or Elizabeth Jones. You're going to need to explain how you came to this conclusion and be sure that you're tracing the right person because that might not be obvious. There may be 13 John Parkers about the same age in the same county. So just, just be really sure. Now, you don't have to explain to somebody all the time that you are searching the right person. If, if let's say you've got an odd name like Alditha Chassis. Okay, the, unless that was a really common name in the family and there are five other Alditha chassis to be found of approximately same, the same age, you're not going to have to make an explanation of that, but you will if it's John Parker. So 
Um, I've given an example here really quick of something that's self-explanatory with no separate analysis needed. Okay, so in this case, we're still talking about Anne Howard. This, is just, this time it's her son, Hobart. Hobart, Hobart O'Hare died in Reynoldsburg, Ohio on the 24th of June, 1957. According to his death record, Hobart was the son of Michael O'Hare and Anne Marie Howard. Hobart married Elena Martirana on the 31st of January, 1922 in Columbus, Ohio. Their marriage record included the names of the parents of the bride and groom. Parent, Hobart's parents were recorded as Mike and O'Hare, Mike O'Hare and Anne Howard. So this is pretty straightforward. Despite the fact that Anne Howard is not listed as Anne Marie in both documents, it's pretty obvious that these are the parents, especially if you also go back to the fact that there is the um, page in the family Bible. Okay, so you're not gonna have to sit down and write an analysis of this. Writing this out and citing it would be good enough. Now, the situation with his wife is different, Elena Martirana. So hers is a little different. According to the marriage record of Elena Martirana and Hobart O'Hare, Elena was the daughter of Luciana Martirana and Giovanna, Tucci Giovanna Tuccini. Elena's death certificate agreed that her father's name was Luciano Martirana, but listed her mother as Georgiana Tuccini. In the 1910 and 1920 census records showed her in the home of Lucian and Georgia Martirana. In the 1900 census, Elena was identified as three-year-old child in the home of her grandfather, Giovanna Squarcia. No birth record was located for Elena. Only one marriage record was found. I'm just going to kind of start paraphrasing here. He married Giovanna Tuccini in 1913. However, he was found listed as the married son in the household of Giovanna Squarcia. His wife was listed as Georgiana Margarata, married daughter. Okay, Based on the evidence examined, Georgia, Georgiana Squarcia was the stepmother and Giovanna Tuccini was the mother. So I realized that just listening to me read this, this sounds super confusing. Okay. So I can provide the slides and you can look at this later, but in a case like this, there's a bunch of confusing and contradictory evidence. And so everything needs to be gone through and you as the researcher, you need to analyze it and figure it out but you're also going to need to explain it to your reader because it's really going to be confusing to them. It's not going to be obvious. So you want to make it really clear that you've figured out who Elena's mother was. So just know when to analyze and know when not to waste the time doing it. Okay, when you get to the end of your paper, you're going to want to not just abruptly end. You're going to want to write a conclusion. You're going to want a conclusion that reiterates everything that you found out. So keep it short, keep it to the point, make sure that it's concise. Like I say, tell the reader exactly what your research objectives were, what exact, sorry, <laughs> tell the reader exactly which research objectives were met. Did you meet them all? Were some of them missing and that still need to be taken care of later? Okay, then do a recap of the facts found. Don't go into a discussion. Don't start talking again about how you looked at the 1900 census and that you looked at this family Bible. Just, you already discussed that. You already covered it. Don't go into a discussion again about what documents you looked at. Don't go into a discussion again about analyzing. This was proved by this. You already covered that. Just keep it short and to the point. For example, over here, you can see this. The main objective of research was to identify the parents of Anne Marie Howard. Additional goals were to learn when and where she was born and if she had been married previous to her marriage to Michael O'Hare. Anne Marie Howard was born the 2nd of February, 1836 in Walton on the Hill, England to Lionel Howard and Anne Darby. It was not determined whether or not Anne Marie had been married prior to her marriage to Michael. So in this case, the researcher ran out of time, didn't have time to figure that one out and that research objective wasn't met. So pointing out that that wasn't taken care of needs to be done as well, but short and to the point. Um, and finally, uh, the last section of a research paper for a client would be the future research suggestions. Okay, now let me point out that this is not a necessary part of your paper. You do not have to include this, but if you are hoping that your client will hire you again for another research session, this is a good thing. Okay, this is 
this is your pitch to get a client to hire you for a second research session is basic, excuse me, is basically what it is. So if you're writing for an academic journal or a magazine, you don't want to include this. If you're just doing a favor for a friend and they're your client, you don't need to include this. But if you're hoping that somebody's going to hire you again, then you would do this. Okay. So if you choose to include this section, um, I would just like to make sure that you need to know that if you're going to suggest the client hire you to do this future research, make sure that your suggestions are appealing. Okay, most clients are willing to hire someone to extend their pedigree further, but they really don't care who their great uncle married. So make sure that you're going to give a suggestions that will actually appeal to them and make them, oh yeah, I might like to hire you to do that for me. Also, before you give a, a suggestion to your client, do a little preliminary research and make sure this is something that you're most likely going to be able to succeed at. For example, if your specialty is Southern United States research, and you don't know a thing about Irish research, but and you're doing, let's say this, Anne Marie Howard and Michael O'Hare. Well, just from the name, there's a good possibility that even though Anne was from England, as we established, Michael is probably from Ireland where they were married. Okay, if you don't know anything about Irish research, do not pitch to your client that you, they should hire you to find out who Michael O'Hare's parents are. That's probably not a good idea. Also, as I said, do some background research. If you are a Southern researcher and your person, let's say they were from Arkansas, you want to do some research and make sure that records exist. Lots of records were destroyed during the Civil War. Things were ruined in floods. Some records were transported to Texas or other counties. So make sure you know what you're doing because it's really embarrassing to, and I'm not speaking from personal experience, but it would be really embarrassing to have a client say, yeah, I'll hire you for that. And then you have to go back and say, <clears throat> well, actually, those records don't actually exist, so we can't do this, or I don't know how to do Irish research. Okay, so just make sure your suggestions are appealing and, and make sure that um, you know what you're doing and that the record collection exists so that you have a good possibility of succeeding. So just quickly on an ending note, look over here. Some good suggestions would be, let's, we're talking about um, Anne Marie Howard still. Good suggestions would be finding out when and where Lionel and Howard and Anne Darby were married. Identifying Lionel Howard's parents. Identifying Anne Darby's parents. Learning when and where Michael O'Hare was born. Identifying Michael O'Hare's parents. Now again, remember, that's not if you are not a specialist in the area, but if you are, those are great suggestions. Okay, weak suggestions. Find out if Heidi O'Hare ever married, and if so, identify her children. Identify the children of Hobart and Elena. Okay, like I mentioned before, chances are high that your client descended through one of these two and already knows, and if not, most people are going to be more interested in finding out who their ancestors were than finding out who their aunt married. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to watch with me, and I hope that you found these helpful.